Okay. Okay. How come? How come a, a biographical, an autobiographical song, in fact, about the group? Well, when we first came out to California, and we met Lou Adler. Uh, we kept mentioning different people that we knew and different groups and who had been involved with us and uh, with members of our group. And uh, he could never get it straight as to who was who and where the people were and so where they were all over the country. And we always knew everybody, and McGuire and McGuire and all of you. So uh, I decided to write him a song that would explain it once and for all, who was who, how everything had happened in mm -hmm. chronological order, mm -hmm. and the, the actual true story of how all these groups had evolved into The Love and Spoonful and Barry McGuire and The Birds and The Mamas and Papas. It's an interesting idea and very successful, I mean, and, you know, when you acted on it, too. Mm, yes. Mm -hmm. Big one. Big success. <laughs> well, what about, can we break it down now and uh, explain for some people who might not know some of the, like in the position Lou was in, who might not know who Zal was or even who Denny is by name? Well, uh, in The Loving Spoonful, there was uh, John Sebastian and uh, Zal Janowski. Mm -hmm. And they worked with uh, Denny Doherty and Cass Elliott, who are two of the mamas and papas, before in a group called the Mugwumps. And, uh, then uh, Sebastian and Zal left the Mugwumps and uh, formed the Loving Spoonful. And uh, Cass and Denny came with Michelle and I at the same time that we had left a group called the Journeymen mm -hmm. <laughs> and all got together and formed the Mamas and Papas. And uh, of course, before that, for years, we had known uh, Barry McGuire and Jim McGuinn, Roger McGuinn. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was just such a, an interaction of people involved. And they were all in the folk music uh, world. And then suddenly, uh, within about a year, I think, almost all of them had switched over to uh, what the media termed uh, folk rock. Mm -hmm. Was it basically for the same reason that uh, all of the people uh, were inspired by the same phenomena in this, in this case? I think so. Everyone was getting sort of tired of uh, reproducing uh, traditional material and felt like you know, it was time to write their own material and express themselves and uh, rise or fall of their own merits, not on how well they could reproduce something that had happened in the 30s or in the 20s, as mm -hmm. it was in the Dust Bowl music and things like that. And uh, then when the Beatles came along and started doing uh, intelligent music and harmonies that were acceptable to folk musicians, you know, who uh, were used to using a lot of minor chords and diminished chords and so forth in their own music, mm -hmm. and uh, proved that it could be palatable to the public, and uh, there was a mass influx suddenly of uh, intelligent musicians uh, and writers into the uh, pop field. Do you recall uh, particularly which Beatles song first turned you on, uh, that you were aware that it was a little more than just uh, rock as we have known it over the past five or six years, I think, at the time? Actually, it wasn't until the sixth album that I really got with them. Really? Yeah. Um, well, what was the sixth? Because the rollover Beethoven things didn't knock me out. <laughs> mm -hmm. but. Uh, uh, Please Don't Wear Red Tonight it was one that I loved. Uh, hmm. I can't think of anything else on that album. We were in the islands at the time, out on St. Thomas. We were just getting together. And, uh, it was just when the birds came out with uh, the Tambourine Man. And, uh, the Beatles had just put out their sixth album at that time. I think it's called Beatles Number no. Six, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. That was a sort of influential factor uh, on us, as from the switch to you know folk to rock. What did you think about the, the initial uh, Mr. Tambourine Man uh, when, when you first heard it? How did you react to it? Uh, I didn't really like it. It was sort of a not oriented to my ear. You know, mm -hmm. my ears weren't oriented to the music. Was actually what it was, and. Uh, it, it was quite a transition for me because I'd always been a rather traditional folk artist, you know, and to suddenly start doing rock and roll arrangements and writing rock and roll songs and things, I really had to uh, sort of learn it all over again, you know. Mm -hmm. When did you re first get into, into folk music and who were some of the people that, uh, that you had been listening to that you enjoyed? Well, I first got into it uh, when I moved to New York. I lived in the village for about five years. And uh, we were playing at all the coffee houses in the village. And we had a group called the Journeyman, which consisted of Scott McKenzie, who's mm -hmm. now doing very well on his own. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, San Francisco, wears some flowers in your hair. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, 
uh, Dick Weissman, who's a fantastic banjo player, who's now a producer for Capitol Records in New York, and myself. And uh, we used to tour with Ian and Sylvia a lot, Flat and Scruggs, and uh, with Dylan. I remember when Dylan first came to New York, as a matter of fact, he was Bob Zimmerman. And uh, he said he was an orphan in Minneapolis. We were playing at uh, Folk City in the village. And uh, he borrowed some bread from the owner, and sat around for a while. He was really a snotty kid. But uh, sort of you know, the, the best writer in America, as far as mm -hmm. I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Did you have any idea at that time that he was the best writer in America, or no, was going to be? No, he was the filthiest writer in America. There's no question about that. Mm -hmm. the kid was really dirty. Mm -hmm. Well, this was back. Now, this was, uh, I presume, around the early '60s. Now we're talking right, about '61 yeah. or two or something mm -hmm. in there. Exactly. That's when he was doing some of the, his Woody Guthrie going through his phase. Right. He was really a, a freaky kid. Mm -hmm and uh, turned out to be a really freaky human being. <laughs> Followed it right through. What was that scene like, you know? Uh, oh, it, was, uh, it was really an inbred uh, society. Uh, no one made a move without everyone else knowing about it. And uh, everyone was on tour together continually, mm -hmm. and uh, working the same circuit of coffee houses, uh, like the Troubadour here, and the Buddha in Oklahoma City the padded cell in Minneapolis, and all these little tiny clubs, you know. You work for 500 a week and just keep going and going and going on this mm -hmm. thing. Then uh, the Hootenanny came along, the Hootenanny TV show. I started packaging Hootenanny tours, and that was sort of the end of the whole uh, folk thing. They just uh, blew the whole thing right there. Mm -hmm. Well, it we no longer be underground. A lot of people aren't interested no. in anything unless it's underground. Exactly, for some yeah. reason. Well, there were a lot of, uh, you knew, uh, you mentioned that you knew Roger McGuinn and uh, Barry McGuire. Were they in that uh, scene, too, in the, in yeah. the village? Or uh, some of them? Roger used to accompany the Chad Mitchell Trio. Uh, he was their banjo player, guitar player, for, I think, oh, two or three years. We were very, we were much closer then than we are now, as a matter of fact. I haven't seen Roger in a couple of years. Uh, we used to my our house a lot in New York. And... Uh, and Barry was, uh, actually it was Barry and Barry. That's the first time I ever met Barry McGuire. He was just another, another guy named Barry, I think. I think it was called Barry and Barry, or Barry Barry, something like that. They were playing at the Troubadour. And then uh, he joined the uh, New Christian Minstrels. He sang lead with them for a long time. He's a fine guy. One of the uh, really straight people in the world was Barry mm -hmm. McGuire. Yeah, I, uh, Lou Adler said some very nice things about him. I want to—I'll get back to him in a minute. But I don't want to lose the, the initial people who turned you on to folk music. Oh well, the Weavers and Seeger, you know, the usual thing, mm -hmm. Lead Belly. Uh, actually, the guy that I was working with, Dick Weissman, was really a, a folk expert. He could sit down and sing folk songs for 24 hours and never repeat himself. You know, and. Uh, he had a master's degree, as a matter of fact, from Columbia, and he had wrote his thesis on uh, lead belly mm -hmm. and the intricacies of lead belly's uh, tonal harmonics or something, I don't know. So uh, I learned a lot of it from Dick. And before that, I'd been in a sort of a semi-jazz thing, you know, where uh, the freshmen, the high lows, the people I really was interested in harmonically and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't find any uh, intellectual satisfaction from what they were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I got into the, uh, the folk music. Mm -hmm. On the, in the, the Journeyman uh, group, you did most of that arranging, didn't you, wasn't that? Yeah, I did, that was did all the arranging. All of it. What, uh, I, I see how I can phrase this without sounding ridiculous and make it a sensible question. Um, were there some of the elements that were later to appear, say, in, in the arrangements in Mamas and Papas that you were experimenting with in, in the journey? Can you go yeah, back Yeah, I didn't realize that until uh, uh, Scott came out here, Scott McKenzie, and he had a, a bunch of uh, the journeyman records with him, mm -hmm. and uh, we listened to them. And I suddenly realized that uh, the Mamas and Papas was sort of a culmination of about seven or eight years' work at an arranging style that... Uh, came together with these particular voices and particular people who were able to uh, 
execute this style, you know, mm -hmm. in the proper way. Because I'm basically much more of a writer and arranger than I am of a singer. Uh, Kaz and Denny and Michelle do most of the, of the real singing, you know. Mm -hmm. and I do most of the writing and, and, uh, and the arranging. Did you teach yourself guitar? Yeah, I can't write a note on paper. True folk style. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yet, the, you know, the, some of the most hauntingly beautiful melodies, I think, written in the, in the past ten years have come out of your head. I wonder, have you always had these, these great melodies in your head? In, even well, when I've you were always had melodies in my head, yeah, but a lot of them aren't so great. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. It all just sort of crept up on me. I went to the Naval Academy, you know, to Annapolis mm -hmm. for uh, a year and a half. And uh, it took me a long time to find out that I was, you know, uh, just not meant to be an engineer or a, a doctor or a lawyer or that I was meant to be a musician, you know, a composer. And I kept fighting against it subconsciously somehow. And uh, mm -hmm. finally, I just gave in and uh, devoted full time to music. How do you how do you work as a writer? Do you usually uh, I hate this chicken and egg question about which comes first, words or music? But it sometimes helps us get a perspective. I would like to have an idea of how you operate creatively. Well, I don't know. First of all, it's a uh, it's a very physical process. I have to stay up for a few days, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> I usually lose a lot of weight, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we were recording, I made these like, 20 pounds on an album, 25, 30 pounds even sometimes. And uh, I'll just stay up until I'm physically exhausted and I, I play continually. And then it seems like that uh, by that time, uh, all of the impurities are sort of taken out and uh, your mind is free from whatever you've been hung up with for the last couple of months or since you've written last. And uh, real things start happening and real lyrics start coming out. And uh, you're very tired and you're very tense and emotional, and you begin to feel real emotions, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when the writing really starts. And as far as the words and the music, it all sort of happens simultaneously. I don't know. Sometimes I can sit down and write a song in 20 minutes, you know. And sometimes it, uh, it'll take me a month to finish a song. Mm -hmm. Usually the 20-minute song is uh, much more provocative than the month-long song, because mm -hmm. I've overworked it by that time. You know? That's interesting. Was uh, Monday Monday a 20-minute song? Mm-hmm. So was San Francisco. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Creaky Alley, we wrote that in one night. But the, a lot of times things will kick around in your head for a long time, you know, subconsciously. And a thought will start to come out and you realize it's not really a mature thought yet, it's not really pregnant. And you shove it back in, refuse to think about it, you know, mm -hmm. and let it roll around some more and it comes out a few months later and it's a round idea then, you know. Mm -hmm. What happens with now when you with the present group? What happens to the song? Say after you have you've uh, filled it out, you know, to your expectations, lyric and and music. Where do you go from there on the arranging of it? And how does it handle with the group? Well, then usually the group comes in, and uh, uh, I play the song for them on the guitar, mm -hmm. and then uh, we all sing it together in unison. Yeah. Then I'll give out vocal parts on it and uh, work out a vocal arrangement, a complete vocal arrangement of the song. And then I'll go in with uh, the musicians and cut the instrumental track, the basic rhythm track. Then we'll come back and put the basic vocal track on top of that. Then I'll bring in the horns or the violins, whatever we're going to use with their instruments, mm -hmm. and put that on top. Then we'll go and do the rest of the vocal tracks on, after we do that.